Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am not your president, uh, Luann Miller. Luann is on Zoom watching to make sure I do a good job substituting for her. I am past president Rob Taylor, and I'd like to welcome everybody to the May 10th uh, meeting of the Coronado Rotary Club. Uh, we're going to kick things off about two minutes early with an invocation and pledge uh, by Debbie Cypress. Oh, that's okay. Well, so, uh, Dan, look at me. Okay, page one. <laughs> Thank you, past president Rob, fellow Rotarians and guests. I have been given two minutes for the invocation. So in difference to Dan or I will make every effort to keep it within the traditional invocation less than two minutes. <laughs> Let us say thank you for the opportunity for us to gather together. Remembering that participation is just a matter of being there. However, Contributing is participation with action. Thank you for providing us with so many wonderful opportunities to contribute. Thank you for the food that we are about to eat and for giving us both the ability, desire to make a difference through service above self. Time, time. Thank you. Does that count on my time? Okay. Yes, it does. Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. All right. While everybody's standing up, we have a birthday in the house. Doug St. Dennis, happy birthday. She is turning 29 again for the third year in a row. And uh, we don't have the Rotary Corral, so we can all be the Rotary Corral and sing happy birthday, starting with my note. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Doug. Happy birthday to you. Okay, now past president Dan Orr gets his turn. Okay, unless a, unless a visiting Rotarian snuck by me at the front door, I only know of one and he's visiting on Zoom. I have no idea I was gonna make his makeup. So everybody say hi to Peter Tomai from uh, Private Equity Park City, Utah. Peter, all right. Now from our my left, your right, my right, your left. Guess the Rotarians. Thank you, Vice President Rob and fellow Rotarians. I want to introduce two special people here today. Um, Pam Saunders, who probably doesn't need a whole lot of introduction, um, you know, who she is right there. And also Susan Higgins, who worked with Marshall, was sort of the, I don't know, the, the main right-hand person with respect to the Citizens Climate Lobby that has a direct link to this presentation today. And I am welcome to you know, host you two here today. So God bless you both, okay? Suzanne. Uh, fellow Rotarians and guests, I'd like to introduce uh, the second time our favorite lion, Fred Eckert, who's a very special guest of Rotary today. Chris Tugood. Thank you, President. Uh, well, who, who, past President Rob, past President Dan. 
Anyway, I just want to introduce for the third time my special guest, Andrew Gade. Andrew, appreciate it. Thank you. Tom Mitchell. Uh, past President Dan, fellow Rotarians and guests, I want to introduce a special guest, Julie Lowell. She is going to get her Rotary One this afternoon. So we're glad to have her. Oh, yes, my wife's here too. <laughs> Right. Oh, uh, right. Former President Dan and fellow Rotarians, I'm very happy to have introduced my special guest, Judith Mansfield. And with Judith is Rob Keller, a family friend from Toronto. Anybody, anybody back in the hinterlands? That's it, stand at ease, smoke them if you got them. Okay, and we're recording in progress. Awesome. Okay, uh, we have red badgers among us um, that I spotted by peeking at the uh, attendance list. Uh, Jerry Brown, please stand and let yourself be known. Uh, uh, Joe uh, uh, Jacobson, John Jacobson. Sorry, couldn't read my own writing, sorry. And Joe Malloy, our perennial red badge tech guy. Awesome to have you here with us. Um, and now um, I've got uh, an announcement slide that we're going to go through, but first I want to call up Ginger Cox for a care and concern uh, message. Past President Rob, fellow attorneys and guests, uh, President Luann called me yesterday and asked me to make this announcement. Um, you remember last week we had uh, Chuck Preto, our district governor here, and actually he's been here a few times. Chuck is in the hospital. Um, Luann said he hadn't been feeling well and last Friday his uh, hip started to bother him and then his leg swelled up and went to the hospital. He had a blood clot. Well, they've determined he has a, a form of aggressive leukemia. And he will be in the hospital for probably a month. Jane is going to pass around two cards. And if you would please sign it, uh, President Luann will take the cards to uh, Chuck uh, next week. He can't really have visitors right now, but uh, we did want you to know that he is in the hospital. And I know he'd appreciate hearing from us. Thank you, Ginger. Uh, um, I can't say enough about uh, about uh, uh, DG Chuck. Um, he's uh, he's the one who put me in charge of the speech contest, so um, so I don't hold that against him at all. And uh, he's a he's quite a friend to Coronado Rotary, so all our prayers are with him. Um, I have uh, so I have an upcoming schedule to go through with everybody. I'm sure you have it all memorized by now, but we have a social tomorrow. Um, our host is. Uh, John Duncan is at 802 Adela Avenue, which is his rental house. So you all are on your best behavior to take uh, take a, uh, a, a cup or something to drink from that you're gonna take home with you. Uh, don't leave a lot of trash around because he doesn't even live there to clean it up. And uh, and uh, anyway, so uh, the usual the usual instructions, bring some uh, an alcohol, uh, alcoholic, an adult beverage and, uh, and, and an appetizer to share. 802 Adela Avenue, 5.30 to 7.30 tomorrow. Uh, beach cleanup is on Saturday at the usual place at the usual time. We're doing flags twice this month. Uh, Saturday, May 20th is Armed Services Day. And of course, Memorial Day, May 29th. Um, we need some lawn bowlers to help us defend uh, or take away the Optimus title that they took from us mm -hmm. through uh, dastardly means last time. So, uh, uh, so please sign up, and um, I've forgotten who's the point person for that, but uh, Natalie Bailey, okay, and she's out of town. So uh, uh, maybe her mom can help take a, take a down a list of volunteers. I know we have plenty of people that can help out. And then finally, uh, Low Tide Ride and Stride, 
Uh, we're going to be beating that drum for another few weeks. Uh, it's on the 24th of June, and Stephanie um, Anderson will be beating that drum to us today in a few minutes. But uh, we have a couple other people to call it first. So, uh, okay, out and about, uh, we have some uh, uh, activities going on at Fisher House. Do we have the Fisher House? Um, it's uh, Fisher House is back in action. We aren't doing lasagna anymore, but we're uh, we're taking uh, snacks and foods over there um, and prepared meals. And uh, and uh, so uh, we had about three or four people. Next visit to Fisher House is on May the twenty second, and um, and you can uh, get be in touch with uh, uh, with Mary Griffin uh, if you're interested in volunteering. The pantry at Imperial Beach, the neighborhood center, uh, thanks you for all the contributions that you. Uh, gave they the need is is constant. We should be getting an email sometime, um, sometime in the next week. Actually, I just saw it uh, yesterday. So um, they're going to be uh, uh, looking for more donations, and uh, you can uh, do something about that. Uh, Rotarians at Workday, Rainier, all right. can you come up and talk about what a great job we did? We have some slides too. Thanks, Past President Rob. Um, Rotarians at Work was a success. It's definitely a day that represents service above self. You know, many of us got up early Saturday, eight o'clock. We got up, got to work, got dirty, and really appreciate everyone who took their time to to join us. For those who were able to attend and those who were with us in spirit, thank you. We accomplished quite a lot. You know, Zayan uh, told us that there were a couple things that we were doing over at. At Camp Surf, there was a lot of work out there. For the people, I saw those pictures. You saw them working on the weeds, staining a deck, and hanging some doors, hanging a sign. And over at the schools, we did a lot of the beautification, a lot of weeding and, and cleaning up of, of some countertops and you know, blowing and just ma making everything look way better than how we found it. So you know, I, I especially want to thank the coordinators that helped make this a success, especially Ronnie Hosler, she has really stood up. I'd like everyone to please give her a round of applause. She had done so well. I got so many nice compliments for how well it was coordinated. I also want to thank Karen Strabla for, for showing her how to do things and just transitioning that really well. And for Brittany Teeter for helping coordinate things in the background. And for Zay for helping coordinate things over at Camp Surf. So thank you everybody for that wonderful event. And we're looking forward to another great event next year. Thank you for spearheading it, Rainier. Okay, that was a great day. Um, Michelle Gilmore has promised to bribe me for, to be able to make this announcement, so take it away. How, I think I have 15 seconds, and I'm willing to pay the fine. It's okay. I'd love to invite you, each one and all of you, to join us this Saturday from 12 to 5 on the streets of Coronado for the Coronado Art and Wine Festival. Raise your hand if you're already planning to go. Lots of hands. Yes. And raise your hand. There might be an artist or two who is showing. We have over 70 artists that are going to be on display. Most of the Coronado artists that you see with the banners will have a booth there. And our student art is going to be right next to them. So we're thrilled to, to, to see you there. The event is free. The wine is not. Thank you, Michelle. Right on time, too. Well done. Um, okay, uh, next is uh, we're going to talk about Low Tide Ride and Stride. So, Stephanie? Okay, more exciting events coming up, too, is June 24th is our Low Tide Ride and Stride, one of our signature events. So much fun. It is benefiting military and first responders. We have 84 people signed up, but we need more signups. You can always go to our website, lowtideride.com. You can always come talk to me. We have many sponsorship levels if you'd like to be a sponsor. If you own a business or know someone who owns a business, they may want to sponsor someone. One of my favorite things is the lowest sponsorship level. Well, you can give any amount, but for $100, you can sponsor a military family to join. 
It doesn't seem like a lot, but a lot of these military, especially enlisted, are running on a tight budget. And for two parents and three kids to run the low tide ride and stride maybe is more than they can do. So you yourself can bring that family out to have a wonderful, fun, happy day teaching the kids how fun being physically fit is. At the end, of course, at Sunset Park, there's going to be an amazing, fun, fair type event. There's going to be live music, vendors, lots of fun there too. So we hope to see you running it, get everyone you know to run it. And if you'd like to be a sponsor, please feel free to come see me. It's no problem. Thanks. In order to be a sponsor that will be on the shirt, it's $1,000 or more. Okay? <laughs> the date. Oh, what's the date cutoff? May 21st. I knew that. May 21st in order to get your name on the shirt because we're going to be printing shirts. The medals are fantastic. We've all already got that done. So um, it's going to be. And the shirts are going to be fantastic. We've got a long-sleeved, dry, quick-dry shirt. The course is amazing. You start at Sunset Park, you're going to go all the way down to the Amphib base, turn around, come back, very family friendly. You can do it on a bike, you can do it with strollers. We had kids in backpacks. It's great. Uh, the, color, the shirts are green. Think emerald green like Coronado Island. The race starts at 8 a.m.? Yes, but you want to get there before. You can pick up your bib before, the day before, or the morning of. I want you to know this doesn't go into my time. My, my, I, I was good on my two minutes. Anyone else? Fantastic. Thank you. See me if you have any other questions. Okay. I have to hurry on to this next one because we're getting paid. Another fine is in the offing. Jeff Tyler is going to make an announcement that he's paid 100 bucks for it. So. Oh, of course, I'll pay a fine. Uh, <laughs> Past President Rob and fellow Rotarians and guests, uh, on, the, on the tables you'll see a flyer. It's light green. says unwavering at the top. The uh, military nonfiction author Taylor Baldwin Kaland appears with co-author Judy Silverstein Gray to, to discuss their new book, Unwavering, The Wives Who Fought to Ensure No Man is Left Behind with journalist Dean Nelson. This event... Also features special guest Pat Mearns, uh, one of Vietnam POW wives from Coronado's own League of Wives. This program is in partnership with the Coronado Historical Association, which this year is commemorating the 50th anniversary of the Vietnam POW's release and homecoming. Um, so the event is Thursday, May 18th, 7 p.m. It's at the Coronado Performing Arts Center, 650D. And uh, there's, again, there's flyers on the table. Call me if you have any questions about it, but we would hope that you, if you're interested in this, that you could attend and participate in it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Um, next, um, I have uh, Jerry Brown it is due to give a Rotary Minute, part of his red badge completion responsibilities. Thank you, past President Rob, uh, fellow Rotarians, and for and guests, uh, uh, Rotary's motto, service above self, reflects our belief in unselfish volunteer service. And in that vein, uh, there are seven areas of focus. The causes that we target to maximize our impact are called those areas of focus. Our most successful sustainable projects and activities fall within these areas. Through global grants and other resources, we help clubs focus their service efforts on peace building and conflict prevention, disease prevention and treatment, water, sanitation and hygiene, maternal and child health, basic education and literacy, community economic development, and the environment, which I believe is the focus of our program today. And projects that focus on these causes are eligible for global grant funding from the Rotary Foundation. Thank you, Jerry. All right, Sharon Raffer is, is next up, talking about we have a Rotary Peace Fellow in Australia, and she's going to talk to us about that.
<clears throat> Each year, the Rotary Foundation awards fellowships to 50 Peace Fellows to study at one of the seven Rotary Peace Centers at premier university, universities around the world. The fellows can earn a master's degree or a professional development certification. Districts, Rotary, and Rotaract clubs play a key role in recruiting and re recommending the candidates. Two years ago, Nancy Nguyen, a San Diego State alum, contacted Coronado Rotary and asked for our club's consideration for an application endorsement and possible club sponsorship. The Rotary Peace Fellowship is designed for leaders com committed to community and international service. Many go on to careers with governments, the military, NGO, and international organizations like the United Nations and the World Bank. Nancy is a 2019 graduate of San Diego State University's Honor College. Hearing about her email through Jamie and past President Tammy Sankey, Luann and I met with Nancy and were very impressed with her passion and, and global activities. We spoke th with then District Governor Dan Gensler, who recommended contacts in District 5340. It was a pleasure to connect with Nancy and tell her more about Rotary's mission, which often dovetailed with her commitment to community and international service. Coronado Rotary became Nancy's club sponsor and recommended she be interviewed by District 5340 representatives. Her application was also sent forward to Rotary International. Last year, we celebrated with pride the announcement from Rotary International that Nancy was selected as a Rotary Peace Fellow for this highly competitive program. Nancy is now in Australia, and, um, and she sent us these slides to tell us what she's doing. So she's at the University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia. And, um, and she said that the most com it's the most competitive Rotary Peace Fellow Center, the third ranking university in Australia and New Zealand. Rotary Peace Fellows are given our own office space with monitors and free printing. It's pretty cool when you're going to college. Three classes, these are three classes of Rotary Peace Fellows and support staff at an annual seminar, and I think that her group is, is uh, 12 people. 12 of the new fellows are studying there. And you see Nancy's on the end, of, okay. And, and, he, and I asked her about her course load. So, so she said that this, these are the classes that she's taking, gender, peace, and security, conflict res resolution, participatory development communication, and human security and development. Um, some of her projects, conducting mediation report for addressing a case of intimate partner violence, Cons consulted a local organization on how to improve their domestic and family violence counseling services, and Nancy is there with, with some of the people that she's with. And in June, a yoga teacher training certificate and August through October, an internship, ideally working with an organization serving incarcerated women or mediation organization. Um, and she, she'll, I'll continue being in contact with her and let you know she, it's 18, an 18-month 18 program and it's fully funded by Rotary, the Rotary Foundation, which is pretty incredible. And, uh, and Nancy, I just had done a lot of things to prepare for this. And it sounds like she's having a really, you know, good time and learning a lot of things. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Okay, so thanks. Uh, Nancy was going to try and zoom in and is having connection problems. So um, that's, uh, that's our update for now. We've been promised more as, uh, as her uh, uh, master's degree progresses, and we look forward to hearing from her um, soon. Um, so this brings us to Marv Hines, who is going to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Past President Rob, fellow Rotarians and guests. Uh, some of the folks uh, that are academics in the audience probably would like for me to read all five pages of presentations and papers that uh, our speaker has written. But 
I think I'm going to dispense with that. <clears throat> Jennifer Bernie holds the Marshall Sanders Chancellor's Endowment Chair in Global Climate Policy and Research at the University of California, San Diego. Yes, that's our Marshall Sanders, the 1991 Coronado Rotarian of the Year. And Pam Sanders is with us today. After earning degrees in history, science, and physics from Harvard and Stanford, Jen Burney apparently decided she wanted to continue her New Mexico high school camping and backpacking experiences because she decided to focus on environmental uh, science. She spent over a decade studying food security and climate change, including examining options for solar powered irrigation projects in Benin and looking at how Brazilian ranchers can use low water forage crops for their cattle. Dr. Burney's focus in her current research is on achieving global food security and mitigating climate change by understanding the relationships between energy and water, food and nutrition security, and climate impacts on agriculture. A professor at UCSD, she leads the Science Policy Fellows Program and is also a fellow at the Center for Food Security and Environment at Stanford University. But in the really cool category, in 2011, she was selected to be a National Geographic Emerging Explorer. Past President Rob, fellow Rotarians, and guests, Dr. Jennifer Burney. All right, now everybody, and folks online, I hope that uh, somebody will make it known if there's any audio issues. Um, thank you so much, Rotarians, guests, and um, really especially these guests over here that are near and dear to my own heart, um, Pam, Susan, and of course, uh, Ivan, thank you so much for arranging this. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's a real delight to be here uh, because I think, uh, you know, the, the, the place that I spend my energy as a scientist uh, really aligns across a lot of the areas of focus um, uh, for Rotary. And so I hope that, um, you know, I have a not so secret agenda. One, you know, one is to just be here, be together, be with you, share a little bit about what we're doing. But the second is to sort of recruit some more involvement um, at UC San Diego with this crew, because I think, um, especially as we kind of come back into full um, social and community engagement after the pandemic, uh, things have changed up at UCSD in ways that maybe uh, folks here aren't so familiar with. So my, my not so subtle agenda here is to try to recruit some more connections uh, with you all uh, into our UCSD community as well. So thanks. Are you going to advance for me? Thank you so much. All right. So I have, um, I, I come uh, you know, from, from up uh, at UCSD right now. And I have two appointments. One is in the School of Global Policy and Strategy. One is at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And I draw that out just to say, uh, next slide, please. I am not alone, and it may come as a surprise that an institution that really has been, um, at least on the policy side, had been really social science focused, now has what is one of the biggest cores of STEM-trained uh, faculty uh, in the world. We're one of the few public policy institutions that does a lot of this bridging across other domains. And so for those of you who are interested in, you know, big, tricky systemic problems, which seems to me to be the focus of Rotary, uh, we're a kind of kindred institution. All right, next slide, please. Thanks. All right, so what I want to talk about today is my own work. I focus on food security and climate change. Hunger and climate are the two stickiest problems, two of the stickiest problems of our time, and they're really deeply coupled. Uh, next, please. So uh, I'll tell you how we think about this uh, in my research group at UCSD. So um, we're thinking about this in, in three ways. So on the one hand, what we do, how we grow food, how we produce it, how we consume it, that produces a lot of emissions, more than you might think. Uh, in our national and in international budgets. So we're trying to understand what emissions are coming from the food system. Next, please. Uh, the, the second thing is we're trying to figure out how emissions in general, but also those um, food-related emissions are changing climate, and in turn, what then happens to our ability to produce enough food, right? So uh, understanding what climate change is doing to our ability to feed ourselves. Next, please. Uh, and then the third thing is what farmers and food systems are doing, if anything, to adapt and how to do that better. Next, please. 
So I want to just start by saying that for, for those of you in the room, uh, again, one of the reasons I think it's special to be here is because Rotary is kind of a systems thinking organization, and, and you have to think about this from a systems perspective, right? The world food system is, is the single system in the world that involves us all. Uh, it's hundreds of millions of farmers. We think it's about 600 million farmers worldwide. Go ahead, next please. Um, all of us are consumers, right? Now 8 billion of us, next please. <laughs> And, and millions, tens of millions of intermediaries, right? Uh, connecting producers and consumers. Next, please. And, and each year, each season, everyone who's producing food or fishing or, or, or ranching, right, um, is, is trying to figure out what to do based on, you know, sort of a set of socioeconomic considerations as well as cultural values and, and, and sort of what they face in terms of their social environment and also environmental expectations. And we know those environmental expectations are changing. Next, please. And so when we think about food security, we really have to think about both production and consumption together, right? We, we really can't decouple these things uh, in the way that a lot of people would like us to believe. A lot of people take very simplistic views on one side or the other here, uh, but, but we can't do that. All right, so if we zoom into these 600 million farms uh, around the world that are producing our food, next please. It might surprise those many of you to, under, to, to hear that most of them, about 500 million by estimates, uh, are family farms. That definition varies by country, and what that means in terms of farm size or farm scale varies a lot uh, country by country, but this means they're family businesses, right? Not big agribusiness. So the vast majority of production is happening on family farms, things we would call smallholder production systems. Next, please. And most of these are pretty small. Again, varies by country, uh, but you know, from something like a third of a hectare or a half a hectare, an acre, let's say, up to you know a few dozen acres. Most of these are small. Next, please. And it may also feel surprising, especially in the border region, when we can get literally any food product we want within 200 miles, we're the luckiest people in the world, uh, that most food is actually pretty local. It's consumed not that far from where it is produced. We hear a lot about you know, blueberries being flown in from Chile, or, and that's an important part of the system, but really most food is consumed quite close to where it was produced globally. Next, please. And I think the most um, pernicious part of the system is actually that most farmers around the world, again, smallholders, um, family farms, most are actually net consumers of food. So almost nobody uh, is, is really self-sufficient. People are engaging in markets. Uh, and trying to um, buy other types of food, et cetera. Next, please. And I think as we think about the world over the past few decades, you know, the, the real sticky part of this problem is that food insecurity is still really rampant. Uh, after decades of progress, we saw three decades of decline in the number of hungry around the world, and in the past four years, that has reversed. That number is going back up again. And it's not going back up again only in a few places that are you know, rife with conflict. It's going back up all over the place. It's worse in certain regions, but, but, but we have mounting food insecurity. That our, our progress against hunger has stalled. Thanks, next one. OK, so what are we doing? I'm going to go through a very brief tour of some of our work. There's too much here to talk about in detail, so I hope you'll forgive me in advance. Again, this is supposed to be an appetizer to get you uh, to come um, hang out at UCSD more and, uh, and go more in depth if that's of interest. Okay, so we've done a lot of work to add up and figure out how much emissions are coming from the world food system. Next slide, please. All right, so when we think about this, next please. Sorry, I built in a bunch of things that I'm making you do, which are not very fair. Um, after, it's really interesting, so I'm, I'm gonna come over here for a second. Uh, you know, food emissions, sure. I love a laser. <laughs> My background is in physics. <laughs> Excellent. All right. So, uh, you know, even as population has grown, of course, uh, emissions really have stayed fairly flat, meaning we did a better job producing food to keep up with population while keeping emissions fairly constant. But they are back on the rise. And this is mostly due to oil crops, soybeans, palm oil in South America and Southeast Asia. Next, uh, please. Uh, I, I'll, we'll go through the next two quite quickly. These, we, we've produced this broken down by product, by process. Next, please. 
um, and by region. And if folks want to dive into this, I'm super happy to do that. Uh, next, please. One thing that stood out from this analysis, though, is if we look over time, we've gotten much better at producing food more efficiently. So here we have sort of how much carbon dioxide per unit of production, and here we have how much food we're making per person, right? So moving to the left and up is good. It's sort of more food, less footprint. And this is the global average. But no region has managed to produce food historically at anything less than about five tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per person per year. So there's a real outstanding scientific question here, which is, is this a true floor? Like, can we actually get to zero? Because if we think of a world, let's imagine creatively, right? If we decarbonize energy and infrastructure and uh, industry and transportation, right? We're making really good progress in these ways. We still have to figure out how to decarbonize our food system. And we need to know if this is possible. Next, please. The other thing that's, that's come out of this analysis is that there's been a really big geopolitical shift in the past two decades. China, which used to be a little bit uh, a weak exporter of food, just small amounts, has become the world's biggest importer of food by a lot. And the, you know, um, the footprint of that food has really changed as well. So China used to be kind of a, a net exporter of emissions uh, risk associated with food, meaning demand elsewhere was driving emissions. And now uh, it's become sort of a net importer. And when we think about what that means, both in terms of food security and in terms of climate, that's a shift that I think a lot of people might not have had at the forefront of their mind. Next, please. All right, what else are we doing? We're looking at how climate change is actually impacting food production systems. Next, please. Um, this is from the most recent IPCC report, so the International Consortium that does, you know, essentially a giant scientific literature review every five or six years. Uh, and mounting evidence, you know, some of which we've done at UCSD, plays into this um, meta-analysis picture. And really, there's this sort of strong signal emerging. A negative means bad impact, <laughs> right? And, uh, and dark color means we're pretty confident in that. Across most regions and across all crops, climate is exerting kind of a downward pressure on crop productivity. There are some regions that benefit, Central Asia, uh, some regions that are a little bit neutral because they span bigger climates, like Northern Europe. But across the board where we produce, uh, climate is now exerting a negative pressure on production, and we know that with great confidence. Next, please. Uh, next, please, sorry. We've done some other work to understand the structure of these impacts. For example, we looked in the United States, and we found that heat, so here's a, what a, a, degree, of, of, a degree C of, of warming does to yield, um, but also to the the likelihood that farmers even harvest their crops and to total production. We found that, you know, when you're having a bad year because of a unfavorable shift in climate, you actually are less likely to even harvest your crops. So we have farmers across the world turning over crops to forage if they're not going to be economically profitable. And so we're having about twice as much production loss as we might have expected just thinking about the direct heat damage. So this ripples through. Next slide, please, or next bit. Um, the other thing we see is, uh, this is in the US, but across the world and across crops, again, what do we get when the world warms by a degree across a bunch of models? We lose entire cropping seasons in this way. So few percent change in the cropping frequency globally, uh, the number of calories that come out of that, and total production. So heat is really leading to systemic kind of stuff. And I think one thing we've learned in the past year is what the loss of a production season looks like. We've effectively got that with the Black Sea port closures with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, right? An entire cropping season of wheat sitting there having a hard time getting out. And we know what that does. That ripples rapidly through the world economy. So we see this signal, and it's a complicated signal. Next, please. Uh, thank you. Go ahead and next one, too. The other thing we've done is uh, think about all the things that are emitted along with carbon dioxide. So aerosol pollution, we're used to thinking of as something that damages human health, but it also uh, changes the amount of light reaching the surface of the planet. It changes the temperature structure of the atmosphere. It changes precipitation. And as a result, one of the things we've done is show how strongly these aerosols um, and other types of pollutants actually negatively impact crop production as well. Next, please. Um, yeah, you did say, thank you. Uh, we, have done some interesting analysis to show uh, how this works by looking, for example, at 
fields around coal plants or power plants when they shut down. Most of the retirements in the United States have been coal-fired plants. Uh, and what we see, first of all, is that, so over here, close to a coal plant, yields tend to be lower. And as you move out, sort of in a ring around the coal plant, yields go up. So just while a coal plant is on, it's actually that pollution is depressing yields nearby. And when they turn off, you see that go away. <laughs> So pretty interesting uh, and not something often thought about as a positive byproduct of our energy transition. Next, please. Finally, we've done some work using really, uh, I'm a, again, I'm a physicist at heart, right? Really great new satellites. Uh, they're so amazing uh, to, to look at sort of whether this holds up globally. And it does. We've looked at, um, we have really great observations of NOx, nitro oxides of nitrogen. Uh, in the atmosphere, and we can see this same relationship, like I told you about with the power plants, uh, where you have increased pollution, you see uh, a productivity gradient. Yields are lower in these areas. So we're putting together this picture of what um, human emissions are doing to the planet, uh, particularly when it comes to food security. Next slide, please. All right. Finally, this last uh, piece of our cycle here, we've been doing a lot of work to think about how and whether or not and whether it's been successful, uh, you know, are farmers and systems adapting to climate change? Next, please. Uh, a few that were mentioned earlier. We've done a lot of work on irrigation, including solar irrigation in Benin, West Africa. This has actually been scaled up to sort of government program level, which is exciting. Um, thinking about how to better manage livestock systems within kind of planetary boundaries. So thinking about what can an ecosystem provide in terms of forage and water, and then designing uh, livestock systems around those constraints. It's been really successful um, in Brazil. We've also done some work on water markets in California, right? thinking about what our water can do. And again, these are teasers, but I'm happy to talk about them. Next, please. Again, I, I did want to come back to more cool satellites. Sorry, I really like them. Uh, We've been thinking also, you know, how do we think about resilience? Um, one of the things we learned um, in, in these detailed irrigation studies in West Africa is that irrigation is an incredibly powerful tool for moving people out of poverty. Right? It provides resilience, it provides stability for farmers producing food. Uh, but when we look around the world, most of the regions that have invested heavily in irrigation have tipped into very unsustainable irrigation. As we sit here in California, we can think about the Central Valley sinking right under its uh under its uh over of groundwater so we've been also working on um thinking about how to develop monitoring networks that would work in kind of real time at policy relevant scales to understand when groundwater overdraft is happening and we've shown that with some of these satellites and ground-based measurements we can watch the surface in california going up and down uh, at pretty high resolution depending on who's pumping more water please. All right, uh, finally, and an interesting new um, initiative or new set of initiatives, we have um, two things I'd like to point out. One is called this uh, Agricultural Technology Adoption Initiative, and the other is, has a great acronym, DAISY, uh, the Digital Agricultural Innovations and Services Initiative. These are both funded by the Gates Foundation, and the idea is to seed a bunch of experiments in vulnerable places to see what works in terms of agricultural technology adoption and how do we help the world's most vulnerable farmers uh, take up technologies and make changes that make their production uh, more profitable and more resilient. So this is now 10 years old and uh, has seeded uh, dozens of really big uh, experiments around the world. Uh, and we've got a new one going now uh, looking at uh, really building off uh, the previous initiative and looking at bundled interventions. So we know that you know farmers often need more than one thing at a time. And so can we provide some efficiencies? Can there be design innovations that help them take up new seeds, fertilizer, irrigation, et cetera? Next slide, please. Finally, I'll say last thing. Um, I, do, I do sit and live in a public policy and international affairs school, right? And so um, perhaps one of the neatest things is that we've been able to connect um, some of the science really into direct um, information for negotiators in the inter international arena. And working with some of my trade economist colleagues, we put together a report for not this past COP, but the one prior um, uh, on uh, climate 
and the role of trade in, in addressing climate change. Again, this idea that we have to think about the world as a connected system. Uh, and this was really well received at COP and we have this just amazing set of connections with the small island nations or as they like to say, the big ocean states. Um, and so this has, this has been really fruitful um, and uh, something that we're hoping can really help make some headway on the problem. All right, so this is where I hope we get to. I think we can do it, I'm pretty optimistic, uh, but it does take a lot of work and I'm really grateful that organizations like Rotary are also involved in this challenge. So thank you very much for having me uh, and for sharing uh, a little bit about this with me. Do we get to do q and A? I think we have time for questions if you'd like to like some. Well, I'm going to hog the stage because I have three questions. Excellent. Um, why are the oil crops the most problematic of all crops? Okay, yeah, great. Let's do them one at a time. So oil crops, soybeans and palm oil are the big, um, the big drivers right now of land use change. So where are soybeans being grown? In mostly in, in the U.S., but also in Brazil. And in Brazil, we're seeing expansion into the Amazon forest margins to produce soybeans. So it's coming with emissions of deforestation. The same is true for oil palm uh, across Central Africa and especially in Southeast Asia and Indonesia and Malaysia. Just seeing very, very rich tropical forests in all these cases being uh, cut and burned to make room for these. Now, I will say it's important to note that oil palm, or palm oil, sorry, uh, is a really important component of nutrition for a lot of poor households, right? Um, you need fats and oils for brain development, right? And so there's, uh, there's some really interesting management that needs to happen there. Yeah, next question. Next question. This sounds counterintuitive, but what is solar irrigation? Yeah. <laughs> Using solar power for the energy to pump the water or move the water. So you have to have some energy to move the water where you need it to go using renewables. Yeah. And then I'll shut up. No. How, you know, I've, how, I mean, we're not scholars. We're not academics like you. So how can people like us at Coronado Rotary, you know, I'm, UC San Diego is near and dear to my heart. How can we be involved? Yeah, I, I, that's a great question. I think there's a huge landscape for involvement. So one is just interest, right? A shared sense of pursuit of these goals, I don't underestimate the power of that, um, especially with CCL folks. Uh, we know what that, that means, to find common ground about issues that matter to us. Um, the second is, I think, you know, if you are interested in particular angles on research, right, getting involved, there's a lot of people doing community-engaged research. There's a lot of measurement happening locally. If folks want to take part in that measurement apparatus, you know, reach out to the project you're interested in. Um, there's, there's typically always ways to get involved. Um, it, yeah, and uh, you know, third, I think the sort of sponsorship of scholarships like the one that was just talked about are really important. And if that's an area of domain, right, getting, getting um, folks help studying that stuff um, is also important. I would say also tell all your nieces and nephews to come to UCSD and, uh, and, uh, and, and send them to me. Jennifer, I grew up in an area called uh, the Boot Hill, Missouri, and, and, and I can remember the process of you know, getting the ground ready for planting and then harvesting was like a four-part deal where you had to plow it, you had to disc it maybe twice, then you had to plant it, then you had to harvest it. So now they've transitioned to something called no-till farming. And so all those, like that cut that process in half. Does that type of initiative on the part of those farmers reach your level of uh, interest? No, yeah, absolutely. So the, the question was about no-till farming, right? So much uh, um, uh, farming has moved to direct sowing of seeds, no need to do tilling in preparation. The other benefit of that is that we sa it saves a tremendous amount of carbon in the soil from being emitted as carbon dioxide. It's a huge win for climate. Um, and the U.S. is by far the most climate efficient producer of soybeans. In fact, one thing that hasn't been talked about was um, when President Trump decided to uh, sort of engage further and escalate this trade war with China, right? China retaliated by saying they were not going to buy U.S. soybeans, right? And U.S. soy farmers struggled and we had to sort of do a lot of 
financial uh, outlays to support them, right? Where did China then go and buy soybeans? In Brazil, exactly. <laughs> you guys are great students, right? China turned to Brazil. Brazilian soybean exports and production jumped, and where were those soybeans being grown? In the Amazon, right. Push, putting pressure on the Amazon. So it was a disaster for climate, right? Uh, so the U.S. is actually very good uh, in terms of climate, uh, you know, not perfect environment more broadly, but agriculturally in terms of climate, it's been a huge win. And as the Farm Bill comes up for renegotiation this year, and I know you all are reading the news and paying attention, there's going to be this effort, again, to sort of decouple, like, social safety net, conservation, and ag. And I think where it all comes together is really soybean farmers in the U.S. They're really at the nexus of that, and it's important that we sort of keep that very robust climate protection program in place. Oh, Hi. Sorry. Right here. Thank you. you mentioned uh, several times you had uh, phys physics as a background. How did you get from physics to what you're doing now? Yeah, well, I would say physics is totally my native language. Uh, I am still very much into it. And a lot of what we know about, for example, how these chemicals behave in the air, uh, in the atmosphere, um, what the energy balance of the Earth looks like is all kind of fundamental physics applied to the Earth system. Uh, a lot of the observations, too, using satellites, those, those products, you, we sort of convert those signals to what we know, really based on fundamental physics. So I have a question about solar panels. Yeah. Um, because of uh, the prevalence of them now, particularly in the United States, uh, vast fields, and uh, I've always wondered if that heat that's absorbed in the solar panels changes the climate because it's not going into the ground. Yeah, it does. It does. It changes local meteorology. And in fact, one of the, the groups that's doing the best study on this is at UCSD. So I would point you to the Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering Department, which sounds a little bit odd, but that's where our environmental engineering folks are. And they have done really, really careful spectral modeling and measurements of exactly what happens with large scale arrays. So there, there are changes. That's absolutely right. There's a ton of work going into like, how do you build a large array in a way that preserves ecosystem function and pollinators and, you know, sort of how do we do, do both at once on the same piece of land? So really great question. Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, at a micro level from a consumer standpoint, you know, I've read about methane produced by cows, avoid eating red meat if possible, almond milk, the amount of water that goes into growing one almond, you know, are there certain products that you would say, if possible, don't eat or don't buy X, Y, Z? Yeah, really great question. I mean, the single thing you can do with the most impact is to eat less red meat. I know nobody likes that answer, but it is. And just a little bit less matters, right? And, and I would say one thing that's interesting, for the first time over the past few years, uh, and actually it was happening before the pandemic, so we don't think it's a pandemic signal, was that actually consumption in the United States had started to go down. So this is a, this is a big demand shift, and it is the thing that, that makes you know, the most difference if you're going to look at the, the biggest opportunity is right there. Just a quick question. Um, when with so many species that are really migrating, so you see animals moving because of heat moving away from the equator, both north and south, um, plants, and, plants and animals, right? Not just animals. Um, when I think about the warming planet and I think about sort of the American breadbasket, you know, when we think about the security of our own breadbasket, what, um, you know, at what point is this region now um, in Canada? <laughs> That's a really, really great question. So the, the sort of corn and soybeans basket is doing pretty well. Um, but I think, you know, that's, that's going to change. We're going to move north in terms of suitability. Uh, I think we're very glad that eastern Washington is in our, uh, you know, national territory because the loss of wheat in the southern central part of the U.S. is, is being offset a little bit by eastern Washington and eastern Oregon. Uh, those farmers are really happy with the short-term changes right now in terms of suitability. But yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And as we think about diplomacy, right, how does this physical story interact with the social and, and diplomatic and, and sort of international order? 
we need to be thinking about what is the set of like trade relationships that make sense, not only from just a domestic security perspective, but a domestic and global food security perspective. Hi, if I could get a question in too. Of course. Um, I recently saw a program talking about a prototype project where they were extracting carbon from the atmosphere and burying it. And uh, can, is that something that you see a future to? Yeah, so uh, so Silicon Valley is really excited about direct air capture right now. So how do we, you know, metaphorically just build a straw to suck the CO2 out and bury it deep in the ground? Um, and, you know, you can do it, right? It is doable. It is very costly right now. And it's not at scale that's, that's meaningful, right? Uh, so I think scientifically it's not really a... It's not such a mystery, it's possible, but the chemistry of how you sort of extract it, you know, absorb it, uh, uh, and, and do that at, at scale and at a reasonable cost is, is really what matters. Yeah. So not a fantasy. Thank you. Great talk. Um, so now that we're not going to be eating red meat, when are we going to all start eating crickets? Yeah, I mean, go for it. They're, they're a good source of protein, right? Well, they were when we were in Vietnam. Yeah, yeah. I've heard all sorts of, like, um, foodie, this is like, you know, high-end foodie restaurant experimentation right now. So I say go for it. Thank you. Great program. Really interesting. I feel like as a nation we're doing a really good job, you know, really setting, kind of setting some precedences. Um, I was interested, I was reading about the Center for Research on Energy and Clean Air, and um, they report that China is opening two new coal plants a week. How do you think that's going to impact uh, our climate and yeah. agriculture? Thank you. Yeah, no, that, that's absolutely right. So we know that just right uh, in terms of, we'll take the climate piece and then the ag piece, but right, um, every new piece of energy infrastructure that gets put in that's fossil based, right, is kind of locked in, right? This isn't like a, an easy thing you to go dismantle a brand new coal plant is not an easy thing. You know, the technology has gotten cleaner in terms of air pollution, but it's still pumping a bunch of carbon dioxide up there that, you know, that's still warming the climate. So, um, you know, and that's gonna be there now as a capital expenditure for 30 years, 40 years, right? So we have this technological lock-in that I think is really, really important that, that we need to think about. And so you're absolutely right, the rate at which China is constructing coal plants domestically, but also helping build them elsewhere, and the rate at which India is putting in new plants, and, and you know, not just those two countries, they're just the biz biggest examples, right, to be thinking about what is, um, you know, an international set of um, objectives, and from our perspective here in the U.S., right, what can we do in terms of how we direct our aid and influence and partnerships and, and private sector connections, et cetera, like the whole toolkit to try to keep additional plants from going in because of that lock-in. We really need to be accelerating the renewables pace. I will say, China is also putting in a boatload of solar panels everywhere, right? So, um, so you see both things happening at once, but we really want to keep tipping towards the renewables side. Oh, online. Yeah, thank you so much. I apologize, online. Where, where's your group on, um, on, this, on nuclear power? Yeah, uh, so, you know, in terms of climate, right, it is a... Uh, so let me just very clearly delineate climate versus environment and sort of safety concerns, right? If we think about climate, nuclear is an obvious solution, right? No emissions. Absolutely seems like you're getting your cake and eating it too, right? Uh, we get all this lovely power and, and no emissions. Of course, it does come with other environment and other security concerns, and those have to be taken very carefully, and I think uh, reasonable people can come to different conclusions on that. I, my research group actually uh, is a bunch of reasonable people who have very different opinions on that, so I would say my group doesn't have a, a consolidated opinion. Well, we have a comment from online or question from Ray Batar. Um, at what honest level 
can we address the issue that developed nations like the U.S. and Western Europe, Europe et cetera, merely export their environmental problems to the developing third world? Yeah, that's a real, real important concern. So, right, domestic policy spills out over our borders, right? If we say we're not going to produce whatever product it is because it's dirty, but people still demand it and we import it, we're just offshoring our environmental harms to somebody else and it gets counted in their tally even though we're the ones who uh, caused it. Um, so there's two things that are happening. One is that there is a real serious look internationally at doing consumption-based accounting. So when we think about the climate framework and the loss and damages framework and how do we sort of rectify this, there's a real sense that just tallying up emissions according to where they're produced is not the full picture and we need to look at the demand that drives the emissions and that's really where the, the attribution needs to be. So I think that is lining up. Um, and, uh, and the second is that you have um, serious looks now at things like um, border carbon adjustments. So uh, thinking about taking the emissions that are elsewhere and, and putting the cost of those into the importing costs. So um, one is sort of an international climate regime tool, the other is kind of an economic tool to bring that externality into the price of the good that's being demanded. So I think, I think there's serious effort in both of those. I lost track of where the mic went though. Ah, okay, perfect, thank you. Well, my first statement is, is that state that Ivan's from is called Missouri, not Missouri. <laughs> um, do, do you have any comment on, on the long-term consequences of the shutdown in both the fertilizer production and wheat production in the breadbasket of Europe, namely Ukraine and Russia? Have you looked at that and what the long-term consequence of that is, please? Yeah, so, you know, right now the sort of um, emergency black seaport agreement was extended, I think, most recently for maybe two months, and we're about at the end of that. Uh, so we are really in a bad global situation where Russia is using food as leverage, right? And that's sort of a world I don't think anybody who thought about 2023 would have envisioned that we're in, right? Uh, so I think it's just worth stepping back and acknowledging that it's like, horrific and sort of outside, really outside the norms of, of what anyone thought would happen. So, so we're in that world. I, I think the pressures will be strong enough that the, the sort of seaport uh, agreement gets extended, but that doesn't, you know, that only does part of it. What's, um, who, who's, Im who's immediately hurt, right? What we saw was it's across the Middle East and North Africa. Those are the folks who, um, you know, that have a, communities that have a lot of poor um, urban consumers, so thinking about Egypt, Lebanon, right, who depend um, a lot on purchases, but who spend a lot of their income on food, those are the most sensitive people, right, for a global shock like that, because they're the ones who in the shortest term can't access food. Uh, and we saw that. We saw, you know, um, big drops in people's ability to, to access food, and, and we'll only understand, I think, the ripple effects of that with time. Um, those remain the people, you know, as this next season, um, is, as this next harvest is taking place, those remain the people who will be most sensitive. Uh, there has been, you know, a buffering in terms of the international order of like, how do we think about sort of advanced procurement on the international market? Uh, I think there's some trade-based smoothing of that. And in the, you know, in the aid world, um, actually thinking about being able to move actual food, not just money, like a little bit faster. Um, this is a, again, sort of a reversal of the world order to think about like shipping grain again uh, in terms of aid. But, but I think that that's where we are. Um, I, re I really hope it gets extended. It's a, it's just a horrible situation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bernier. I don't know about you all, but I, I feel a lot smarter about climate change and food than I used to be. So uh, this was very educational. Thank you so much. All right, next, next week, uh, we're going to have, we're going to be at the Kays Yacht Club uh, for the Coronado High Athletic Awards with uh, Robin Nixon handing them out. And it's a, it's a club favorite, so be there, be square. And with that, have a great Rotary Week. <laughs>